I think we are on. Yep. That's right. I can see Bath. It's going to, his head's going to be eaten. Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the sixth edition of Careers at the Cutting Edge of Engineering. Today's episode is a panel discussion on uh, careers in game development. Um, as part of your, uh, well, before that, let me introduce myself. I'm Sudha Kumar. I'm the director of the USC Viterbi India office, and I'm based in Bangalore, India. Um, and uh, what we've uh, done as part of our registration was asked if uh, the audience had questions. Uh, many of you um, submitted some questions, uh, and what uh, we have done is try to fold many of those questions into uh, the panel discussion today. Uh, but feel free to send us more questions um, in the chat box, and we'll try and get to them um, as, uh, as we go along. Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our fabulous uh, uh, panelists. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mike Zaida. He's the founding director of the USC uh, Computer Science Games Program, and he's a professor of engineering practice in the USC Viterbi's um, School of Engineering. He founded the Computer Science Games Program and the year-long advanced game projects course that forms the core of USC Games. And he took that program from no program at all to the number one games program in the world. That program has been ranked number one by Princeton Review for 10 of the last 11 years. His alums have shipped games played by over 5 billion players, about 250 billion in revenue, and $2.5 billion in payroll to those alums. So that's a lot of billions, uh, Mike. Very, very impressive. It, Congratulations it, and welcome to the program. Yeah, it's important to do those numbers because people always ask is, you know, what do I get out of my college degree? And I said, well, we keep, we prop up the economy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So our next panelist is Bharatwaj Nandakumar. We call him that. He's a veteran games uh, developer with over a decade of experience working in the trenches on a wide range of high profile to play video games. He currently leads technical engineering at Retro Studios, a subsidiary of Nintendo. He's based in Austin, Texas. Um, you know, apart from all the other things that he does, one of the most important things about that is that he is a USC alum. So welcome uh, to the program as well, Beth. And our third panelist is Candace House Texera. She's Associate Dean Corporate Engagement and Programs at USC Kentucky. <clears throat> Among the various other hats that she wears, she oversees the Engineering Career Center. And what she does is um, give, does a lot of things with her team um, and does magic for the students and gets a lot of companies to come and recruit. So she will be giving us a lot of information about uh, the companies that come um, to our campus to hire students in the game development. Um, she will also talk about all the wonderful things that they do and all the services that they provide to students uh, and help them um, find great jobs. So welcome, Candice, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from all three of you. And without further ado, I'm going to start asking the question. The first question is to you, Mike. Um, can you give us a quick overview of game development as a field? Um, I know there's the creative side and then there's the technical side, but tell us what are all the components that go into game development? Oh, wow. There's so many pieces and parts in game development. You might ask that question at bat, but <clears throat> um, you know, I founded the computer science games program because I was interested in the technology for advancing the future of games. So the whole degree program is oriented towards that to providing engineers who build fantastic games of the future. But in, in terms of hires, I, I think it's in the industry, it's like 65% of the demand is for engineers who know how to build games. And about 30% is, uh, is for artists who know how to do game art and design 
and 5% after that is people who can do gameplay design and other things as well. But, but now there's big components of uh, machine learning that are in games that you know understand users and track users and make better games for users and it's it's grown enormous so yeah. so those are that you know so that's that's the sort of the high level okay so that what do you have to say to that what are the various aspects yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to what Mike said, uh, the, it also has entered into like the, you know, architecture industry, the automotive industry, even healthcare. Um, so, you know, people want to get, you know, healthcare to be gamified in some ways. And I have a few friends who are also working on products like that. Um, but in general, like digging it a bit deeper, like it's not just engineering, uh, it also caters towards like artists, you know, animators, um, you know, AI engineers to to program AI, and then there is there's more like VFX to QA to you know business side of things. Yeah, yeah, no, it just seems like a lot. So we are seeing a lot of multiplayer and interactive games now, especially with COVID and the social distancing norms. So what are the trends in game development? What is what is the big thing now? Well, I, I think that the during COVID the. the number of players has increased at companies like Electronic Arts by an Activision by uh, 20%, 25%. So you had a lot of people jump into games who weren't heavily into games because games are quite social. You know, you get to yeah. play, you get to play against someone, you get to chat with them. And that becomes, you know, when you're locked down and staying at home, that's what you do. So online games are really big now. And uh, there's, you know, more demand for higher speed network connections. So, in, yeah. you know, in the United States, what I discovered is uh, if you called up your cable uh, uh, internet provider and said, I want a higher speed network, you actually got one gigabit, no questions asked for lower cost than you were paying already. <laughs> so oh. I, I upgraded my LA apartment and my home in, in Carmel by the sea. And it was like, oh, wow, this is easy oh. and cheaper. So I think you're going to see more of that. I think yeah. that once you have that those high speeds, then games of the future are going to be able to go off and connect to very large server farms where machine learning and interesting things are happening in machine learning that you interact with. Yeah, yeah. Bach, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, in general, like we've we've noticed a lot of uh, increase in a in free to play multiplayer games, especially. Uh, just because the fact that it, it has the low cost of entry for everybody, especially in this pandemic situation. But at the same time, I, in in other ways, like it's actually making people stay at home a bit longer because they're at least busy playing playing games as opposed to going outside. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like for, for me on a personal level, like I've actually connected back with my school friends and started playing the games from the 90s in some ways yeah. because you know it, it that's how we played when we were students and then now like during weekends like there is nothing else to do because you cannot go anywhere outside so we end up like forming our teams and clans and you know uh, that's been the best uh, part of it because it acts as almost like a therapy too you know to to get back to your friends and family and you know uh, play with them so yeah yeah there's a very strong connection to games is the games you play when you're young uh you want to go back to and the fact that you can still play them and go back to them is, is pretty awesome and uh, yeah. that connects people and it still feels good like some of the games which i'm playing at the moment are from the 90s and you know and it it, it still runs have has no issues <laughs> we still go back to the old uh, vpn tools to make sure that we all can play together so <laughs> yeah <laughs> are you playing are, are you playing with the high school trends yep and, and how does that feel? I mean, are they all, you know, do you, is it make it like you're in high school once again? Uh, in some ways, uh, except that now, like some of them have kids, uh, so their kids also watch them play. Uh, yeah. And and it's been it's it's been a very interesting, uh, you know, some of us are married, some of them, uh, you know, are, are having kids and we still end up trying to find one time slot. And the best thing is that we are now in different parts of the world and we still kind of coordinate the same time. And we also, you know, schedule the time based on which game they are interested in. 
So some of them like ga racing games. So we have a time slot for racing games. Then some of them play like, you know, real time strategy like Age of Empires. So we just got, you know, the definitive edition of Age of Empires and started playing that. So. <laughs> I, you know, so I, I hear from my my kids as well that they're doing a lot of this. So I think you've saved the sanity of a lot of people with uh, with games during these COVID times. So uh, this the next one is an audience question, and it goes to you, um, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see this industry in about five years? Oh wow! So uh, <laughs> I I think it's going to continue to grow. So the um, and I think it's going to continue to grow in an interesting way. So, you know, in uh, 2005, when I founded the games program, the game industry was the same size as the film industry in terms of revenue. Now it's about five times the size of the film industry in terms of revenue. And in five years, I think we're going to be seven or eight times that. But there's going to be this interesting mix because uh, there's huge investments now in esports and esports teams management that looks a whole lot like sports management. And there's a couple of startup companies that I'm looking at right now that are have technology for uh, interacting. You know, you're watching an esports venue where you have superstars playing a particular game at a particular level, and they have a technology that allows you to uh, select a button saying, "Put me in that game in that level right now." Hmm. So I think there's going to be a lot of that, which is, and I think it's also going to turn into television shows. You know, there's going to be reality shows of lives of esports stars. Um, I'm seeing uh, companies that are also doing that as well. So wow. there, there's a lot of investment money in those spaces. So in exactly. five years, that will all be out and around. Okay. So the next question is How is virtual reality changing game development? And uh, I, I, I'd like Mike to answer this question first, and then maybe back as well. Well, so, so, you know, this is a hard time for virtual reality. So virtual reality has come and gone and come and gone and come and gone. So we, we looked like there was going to be a lot of interest because virtual reality headsets got quite cheap. Uh, the interesting, there was lots of investment in all kinds of different headsets. So if you went back, uh, say, to 2014, you saw a lot of people wanting to invest in Oculus, a lot of yeah. people wanting to invest uh, and see what HTC was going to build. But there was z near zero investment in um, content for these virtual reality experiences. And also, there was no standardization of, if I buy this one game in virtual reality and get buy the next game, they have completely different interfaces. Yeah. Like when you play a shooter game, on any platform, they're pretty much all the same interface at this point in time, or similar similar enough that it's easy to figure out, but virtual reality is in 3D and that's much harder for people. Also with COVID, you know, people, uh, virtual reality headsets have not been cheap enough for everyone to own their own. So with COVID, no one's sharing headsets. Yeah. I, I know one company that is pretty awesome. It's a company called Athanos, which is invented a technology for uh, building virtual reality without a headset, like in a flat panel display that you could hold in your hand or in a, 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 a small $100 projector, a okay. stereo image. So there's people who are doing things that are, going, that are research companies right now that have great technologies that might be the future. Uh, but right now, the primary use of virtual reality is, is in uh, B2B, which is medical, architectural, and, and other industries like that. And games, it's, it just hasn't been there. It hasn't been in the you know, millions and billions of players that they okay. to make it a real big. Yeah, because of the, the cost. Uh, we, do have, we do have a wonderful graduate course in, in that, uh, in augment, and VR, AR, and mixed reality experiences. That's taught every okay. semester. Yeah. Do you want to add something to that, Bat? Yeah, I mean, uh, virtual reality in, uh, Again, as Mike mentioned, would be you like would be used in you know uh, in it it has a bunch of different problems. One is using it in public areas because you know how how do you wear headsets? Like, do you really want to wear a headset which someone else wore? Uh, but then at the same point of time, to bring it home, like the cost of entry is a, is a problem. But beyond that, I think 
most of the games were generally focused on uh, getting the players immersed and engaged for a longer period of time and the virtual head reality headsets don't really serve that purpose because it's too bright on your eyes so uh, that's that's the place where i had a lot more inclination towards ar and mixed reality uh, but then the tech for that is a little bit you know far fetched at this point because of you know hardware and and other constraints because again who wants to wear a virtual reality headset which has a bunch of wires like sticking around you know you want something which is hands free so yeah. yeah the only the only company that's done really well in ar is pretty much niantic laboratories and okay. niantic uh when they were part of google the product manager for pokemon go was a graduate of usc hmm. yeah i'm uh, i'm sure he's, okay. now the, he's now the product manager for google stadium <clears throat> so all right so um, the next question is, gaming is now affecting uh, multiple fields. Uh, Bat was mentioning uh, about health, for example, and uh, training and public policy. Um, uh, so can you talk a little bit about this? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, in, in, in medicine, there's huge interest in virtual reality because the doctors want to be able to look inside the body. They want to look, they're interested in AR and VR. So they're still quite interested in it, and it's not a big deal for them to wear a head mounted display if they're doing something in particular. It's not, a, and they love technology. So in that yeah. field, it's great. Um, in architectural firms, if you went to Gensler in downtown Los Angeles and talked to them, they always do virtual reality previews of all of their buildings. In fact, I had a discussion with them at one time, which was they had the full 3D building models for something like 750 buildings they had designed and <laughs> built. And we're wow. wondering how could they sell those models for game for, to the game industry? And the only problem is they're super high resolution. You know, every doorknob, every, every doorknob looks absolutely beautiful. And it's way too, you know, it's way too complex for using on a game console or a PC at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So architecture and medicine, very big deal. Okay, and, and training and education. is the other uh, area as well, right? I heard the like the army uses uh, a lot of uh, gaming. Uh, the military has always used a lot of gaming and AR and VR technologies, and continues to do so. Uh, I started the army on uh, going into the use of games in 2000 by building the America's Army game, which came out and became one of the top five games online went in 2002. And since then, the Army has turned all of that material into simulation systems uh, that are used across for all kinds of training inside of the Army. Yeah, wow. That was saying education. Ed, you know, it used to be in 2004, no one wanted to make an investment into online education or online games for education. And now with COVID, there's huge demand and huge movement. And in fact, um, they, uh, before COVID, right before COVID, probably a year before COVID, I knew no few, I was approached by no fewer than four, four Chinese companies that were getting major money from the Ministry of Education in China to build games for education. In fact, I had one student group that moved back to China to get that money to go build AI plugins for games for education. So. I see. Yeah, Make, makes sense. Um, what about you, Beth? You uh, you brought up uh, the, the um, idea of using games for health and so on. Um, do you want to add something to this? Yeah, I mean, yeah. one of the main things is to uh, get people to be engaged with day-to-day -day activities. So, for example, if there is a there's a device, say, where you measure your temperature or your or your biometrics, like every day, uh, to to you know to maintain a healthy lifestyle, uh, the, one of the biggest questions which comes up is like, how do we get people to actually en stay engaged and keep in touch on some of these things, right? Like uh, if now, for example, the Apple Watch kind of measures the heart rate, but that's just a small metric. But then there's a lot more metrics, which ideally, if somebody wants to stay healthy and track their fitness, they should be engaged in doing, but then, you know, the, the main, uh, thing is that at that point it comes to gamers to ask about like, okay, how do you engage players, right? How do you make yeah. it fun? And the same thing comes with education. Like a lot of the times education-based games 
were always made by people who are in the education field, but not actual gamers. So right. they make a, a product which is catered towards learning, but then it has absolutely no engagement because they don't kind of find the fun in that. Uh, so there is a lot of questions which come along those lines. The same thing comes with like, you know, gene editing and, you know, any, any of the genetic stuff. There's a lot of like games and gamers who are involved in problem solving because games kind of help them, you know, focus on some of those skills. So there is a there, like that's that's the big thing. Like as we look at the future, it's going to kind of spread in all sorts of interesting ways because gaming is not just something which you sit in front of a TV and play. Uh, it, just like Mike mentioned, it's going to be in shows. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the uh, one of the Black Mirror uh, episodes, kind of like the Bandersnitch episode, kind of like showed uh, an, an example of how branching storylines can actually work in a TV show. You know, stuff like that. So yeah, it's 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 very very interesting uh, moving forward to see how many industries kind of like take over. In fact, I I even saw a recent posting that Tesla is trying to hire a lot of people for for games because they want people to start making games for the Tesla. But beyond that, now, you know, with, with the rise of SpaceX and, you know, space travel, now they want games for space because they want people to be engaged and happy and kind of like, you know, uh, interact with each other and have fun because going to space is, is, you know, they don't have people to interact with. They don't have internet to interact with. So there's, there's just, it, it's just expanding further and further. Yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. I think yeah. With, the, with the COVID lockdown, uh, making games for space might just be one of those things that happens because, you know, they, they can't really leave where they are also. And, uh, yeah. On the education side, there's some country. Uh, one thing I would mention is uh, the country of China uh, actually uh, froze approval of all new games for about a year to game studios in China until each of those game studios came back with a plan and a game design to build a game for education. So they all had to make the next game a game for education. And uh, I, I, I've seen that happen, and it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, that, that's really um, interesting. So, uh, Mike, the next question is, um, if a student wanted to, to get into this area of gaming, um, you know, and uh, they wanted to become a game developer, uh, maybe an engineer, um, do they have to do that at the undergraduate level or can they do this at the master's level? Well, we have a master's program that will, you know, assume that yeah, but what going into if a master's in computer science specializing in game development. But uh, one thing that will prepare you for that program is become a strong programmer. Uh, be a really strong programmer in C++ before you come to USC, download a game engine like the Unreal Engine and become uh, quite proficient in that. It's a free engine. You can, you know, learn how to build stuff with that and do that work before you come to SC and it'll make the program a little bit smoother. You can, of course, learn that in your first semester. It just makes it that you're learning a game engine at the same time you're trying to use a game engine. So, uh, so, so, so if they have an undergraduate degree in uh, computer science, then they can uh, they can start with a game development program uh, when they come to USC. Absolutely, absolutely. We we've we've graduated many many successful master students that have gone okay. to great great places. You know, when we were having our discussion the other day, you said something that uh, really uh, I thought that uh, you know, uh, prospective students should definitely know. You mentioned something about Java and C plus plus. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and this Could is sort of, this is sort of classic. I it, when I started the program at USC, um, I met with Electronic Arts, and Electronic Arts said we don't usually hire from USC because their beginning programmers learn Java first before C plus plus. If we learn that if we and they actually told me if we if we learn that they learn Java before they learn C plus plus we cancel the interview, and so oh. so you know C plus plus as a language, um, I think when did I first use C plus plus nineteen eighty two, this is an old language, and it, and it yeah. keeps getting upgraded and all, but it's like the you know it's the it's the it's the game it's the game language of champions, uh, and yeah. so, so maybe that should interject into this issue. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if you want to work on hardcore, like actual game development, yes, C, C++ and C Sharp is the way to go. 
uh, but then again, if I don't, I don't uh, like. There are generally C plus plus people and there are Java people, so they are generally mutually exclusive uh, because people who like Java hate C plus uh, plus. But then on the other hand, if you still want to be involved in the gaming industry and you love Java, maybe some of the back end work for the games would be super useful. Uh, yes. But then again, at that point, don't be disappointed that you are not working hands on on the actual game because the actual games don't use Java. Yes. Yeah. So, so these are the kinds of things that students need to know. Prospective students need to know when they are trying to get into this field, and it's not easy to get this information, which is the purpose of uh, this panel today. Yeah. All right. So, um, I get a lot of questions about um, what are the skill sets uh, that a, a person in this industry needs. So, um, when when uh, companies are looking to hire, uh, what are the skill sets that they're looking for? Well, I, I think they definitely want you to have strong technical skills. So they want you to be a strong programmer. They want you to be able to show what did you build? Did you build any semester long projects in teams? They want to know two things. They want to know what did you do in that team? But also, are you good at working in teams? You know, because game industry or an engineer working with artists and designers and, and business people. And, uh, and are you able to collaborate with that type of people? And so they're looking for people who have uh, good temperaments, who are great collaborators, who are verbal. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the advice I always give to our students. So it, in fact, I will tell you, my, my experience at SC has been the students who are the most verbal, who are the strongest technically, uh, are usually going to be superstars in the game industry, right? Yeah. So Bat, any interjections here? Yeah, I mean, when when I interview uh, anybody, you know, especially for entry level positions, uh, I look for a, a bunch of basic qualities. One is, which is the most important, is problem solving. Um, it doesn't matter how deep of a technical knowledge you have, because technical knowledge is an acquired skill. But then, you know, the the passion for the games and the gaming industry in general, and the you know the attitude to problem solve. It doesn't matter what what hurdles you face because there's always going to be something new which you don't know which you're going to face. So just that uh, ability to problem solve and uh, learning, like knowing the foundations in general, like right from bit arithmetic to vector math to you know some of the foundations, even before going into the actual coding is probably the most important thing because if you know the foundations of it if you know how to calculate uh, numbers you can you know do calculate any, whether it's large or small numbers you know it's it's along the same lines and the the main thing is we look for that we also look for communication uh, it is about having a positive attitude but at the same time uh, you know it it doesn't matter whether you have an accent or not uh, you know, the accent and the actual like strength of the language is different, but the main thing is to communicate your idea. And then the last thing which I always tell for engineers is to have the flexibility. Uh, you just cannot say, you know what, I know only graphics programming, I'm going to do only graphics programming. Right. There are specialists for those things, but especially in the entry level, you would want to just get any challenges you would want to work on it. Um, in fact, in my first uh, six years of my career, uh, I've done right from like sound engineering to UI to tools to gameplay, because again, whatever the studio or the team needs, that's what you want to work on. You just cannot isolate yourself and say, you know what, I'm going to do only this. In fact, the, the, when they hired me into Activision in my early days, they hired me as an online engineer. And I was the only online engineer hired in Activision at that time. But then all I did was not just online. I did a whole bunch of things. Yes, there will be stuff which I would do better than, you know, for example, graphics or physics, I would not do as well as online or gameplay. But again, it doesn't matter. You need to have the flexibility and the attitude to problem solve. Because end of the day, when you are like working on your game at 4 a.m. in the morning, the night before you ship the game, it doesn't matter what your title is and what your specialization is. You need to ship the game and make sure that you fix issues in the game and be a team player there because there will be people who will be burnt out at that time. Yes. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. 
Um, so, um, <clears throat> Mike, do you um, suggest that uh, uh, students uh, develop and submit a portfolio when they are applying? I think they should always have a portfolio going and they should have a website where they show off, here are the things I built in the past. Here are uh, video demonstrations of those. Here's source code you can look at or even the executable. They ought to always have that. But in terms of admissions at USC, I don't think the admissions office looks at any of that material. No, but in general, it's a good thing for uh, a person getting into this field to do. Absolutely, because when you when you first apply to a game company, you can say, here's my website. Here's the last 20 projects I did. They'll go, wow, that's great. And they'll look at it. They'll look at it before they interview you. Okay. All right. Um, Bat, anything to add to that? I, I completely agree, uh, you know, especially now with WordPress and other like free tools where you can actually make a website very easily. Uh, again, nobody looks at how beautiful your website is or uh, the main thing is that you, you should, when you make your website or your portfolio website, focus towards how to keep it easy to access your content and your projects. Showcase your projects, like, you know, make it easier. Uh, make sure it doesn't take a lot of time to load. Uh, because again, an, on average, somebody will spend uh, two to three minutes on your website. So you want to be able to show that content as early as possible. But in my early days where I did not have access to WordPress or anything, I ended up making like PDFs of some of my main projects. And I used to attach that in my job hunting emails because at that point, like my my resume, my cover letter or my body of my email at these at attached PDFs together paints a picture of what I can do. And sometimes I've even gone to the extent where I've even attached like sample codes uh, to kind of show uh, how I program or how I architect my code. Uh, but then again, it need not be a fully working project. Nobody wants to download like a hundred meg uh, project with EXEs and everything. All you want to attach is sample codes to kind of get a sense of it. But then now, because there are websites for it, I think you can you can just go hog wild. You can, you can go with creative and try to get uh, a, a simple, easy access website where people can just click on it from your resume and see like, oh, okay, this guy worked on this project, which I'm interested in. Let me go and check out the video or whatever there, but make it easy to access uh, with the most minimum number of clicks. Okay, uh, that's really, really good, good advice. I think uh, students will find that very useful. Mike, um, the next question that we get asked all the time is, uh, uh, is it a good idea to take uh, courses online, like MOOCs, um, and uh, do get certification? Is that something that industry, when they are hiring you, see that as an advantage? I, I think uh, your the best advice for anyone's career is it's lifelong learning. So if there's new stuff you don't know about and you already have all the degrees you want to get, then you should you should definitely use online learning. I mean, right now. We're doing a very big experiment, which is we've gone fully online learning. And uh, Mike's our experiment last semester, uh, it came out really well. In fact, I, I think uh, some things actually worked better in Zoom form than in classroom form. The students could actually see the slides instead of the, the projection with the bad bulb. <laughs> so, so it was, uh, uh, I think it's uh, good. But I do miss seeing my students in person and, and nothing gives me more great joy than sitting in my office and the student comes in and says, can I talk to you? And they want to talk about their career and their interests. And next thing you know, an hour has gone by and uh, then they go off and they do great things and they come back later and said, you know, I'm, I'm here because I had that conversation with you. I just had a young woman who came into me like three years ago and talked to me for an hour and she wasn't even a USC student. She was a student of, I think, University of Pennsylvania. Somehow she walked into my office and she just sent me a note like three weeks ago saying, I decided to become a high school teacher and I built a games program inside of a high school and it's just got this big award and donation and everything. And she goes, that's because I talked to you. So, yeah, I, I missed that part. All right. Yeah, no, it's amazing. No, I know. I know you inspire a lot of uh, students. Candice, uh, what, what is your advice for students when they ask if they should take up? Um, 
certifications and uh, and uh, courses on, say, Coursera and things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, this is probably some of my other hat, which is our, our executive ed continuing ed program. So also a huge fan of lifelong learning. Um, the, the piece that we hear a lot from organizations and companies is in whatever you do in, in terms of certifications outside of a traditional university or other learning environment is make sure that there's a knowledge assessment attached to it. So there's, of course, just learning and, and having the, the new vocabulary. Maybe it will help you when you have discussions and you network. Um, but if you're trying to add something to your res CV, or if you want this to help enhance what you're doing um, in the gaming area, there should be some type of, of knowledge assessment and not all um, MOOCs and open courseware has that. And so that's something industry has said, you know, when we see someone has been badging or, you know, they've received digital badges or they passed certification and received continuing ed units, then we know that there was some measurement of knowledge. So that's step one. And then step two is really, what are you doing with that? So how is that enhancing the portfolio that Bob was talking about? Or, you know, just, uh, just how the panelists have been sharing, what does this translate into what you can create and develop? Keep that in mind during shopping around for some of the different online courseware that's out there, the free courseware, um, and, and you'll be fine. There's definitely um, room to keep learning, but just um, what you take away afterwards is what the companies are trying to understand. And that's where certifications, measurements of knowledge, and how you bring that into a portfolio will help you. What about you, Beth? You have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree can... to it. You know, yeah. I completely agree to it. But at the same time, again, something for everybody to understand is that it's not the number of badges you have or the number of courses you took. It's about what uh, what's the quality of those courses or what did you gain from it? But more than anything, I personally believe that no knowledge is bad knowledge. Uh, in fact, like before I had my one on one conversation with Mike back in 2007, uh, I was actually focused on robotics. Um, and sometimes someone can think, you know, is robotics knowledge ever going to help you in gaming? Absolutely, yes. Uh, but the main thing is, again, would by putting robotics knowledge in my resume, would that help me find a job in the gaming industry? Maybe not. But the main thing is that every knowledge, every everything which you learn, especially as things spread across different fields, there is always value for everything you learn. But if you're looking at entering into the gaming industry, then look at some of the job postings, see see what they are require what they have as requirements. But at the same time, add the personal touch to it. You can easily take a, a six month six month course, make a project from that course, and then call it your project. But that you know there are going to be thousand ten thousand people who've done the same. But then how do you stand out from that course? How do you expand on that project? And, and how do you sh make it your project? And you know those things are the ones which really, really matters. Because for example, when I was applying for jobs in the gaming industry, some of the games which I even had was games which I made even before I joined SC. And the main thing is that, yeah, th those are not like giant, like massive projects which you know, people are talking about, but the key thing is each of those projects gave me something new to learn. And, you know, it right from integrating like Visual Basic with Flash, which probably like nobody in their senses would ever do. Uh, but, but just doing that and getting a sense of how hard making a game is all by yourself is itself a big uh, learning uh, experience. And then like, to be honest, like the, when I entered the gaming industry as a, as a network programmer, I actually in my last semester was the time where I took network games under Zyda. And, and the main thing is that I had a conversation with him that I had absolutely no networking knowledge at all. And so my entire semester was focused on learning networking in general, the foundations of it. Like I, I was also like helping uh, Mike's uh, uh, second edition of Mike's uh, network games book, but at the same time, so my project was to actually learn network games through Mike's book and update it to the latest tech at that point of time, but still end up leading the network games class and the games which we made in class. And so it is a continuation of what is there, but at the same time, people like Mike and I, like we can give you insights of what's happening in the industry and what are the kind of jobs which are open, 
but the key thing is to kind of learn those things uh, but then go a step beyond that because just a course knowledge alone is not going to be you know nobody is going to look at the badge and say you know what you know everything about it absolutely not we are going to ask and twist the questions in in different ways and the only way you can answer is is when you get hands on experience on it you know one of the things that does happen to me a lot is is former students come back at certain points in their career when they want to make decisions and they sit in my office for an hour i i had one student who graduated with an undergraduate degree in from our games program. And he came back a couple of years, he went to electronic arts and had a great job doing it and get, play design. And uh, he came back a couple of years later, and goes, I'm interested in robotics. <laughs> and he, he applied to graduate school at Boston University. He got in and finished a master's degree there. And then he called me up on the phone and said, I'm applying to, I applied to medical schools for an MD and a PhD program. And he wanted me to help him sort which school he should go to. So he is just starting this semester. Blade Olson is the guy, if you remember him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's starting in the joint uh, USC Caltech uh, MD PhD program. Okay. And All I, right. he even asked me if I would be on his uh, PhD committee. And I said, sure, of course. So students come back. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I have had over 3,000 students in my classes in 16 years. They come back and talk to me at various stages of their career, even when they're when they're a student and when they graduate and when they want to make some future decision or they want me to be advisor to their startup company. So in, in fact, the interesting thing is I actually got a, an offer in a startup company before I, I landed my offer with Activision. And the, when, when I actually got the offer in the startup company and went to Mike, like Mike was the one who guided me and said like yeah i don't think you are you you need to go there you need to go to a bigger place and you know eventually he was the one who referred me into activision and eventually i i, I nailed that interview but the best thing is that's the connection which we have as a trojan family and mike has been like a mentor for me for a long long time and the key thing is that even after 12 years when i was making a decision of leaving activision I actually had a conversation with Mike about it, and and you know, as I'm even even though I've I've mo I'm moving to another company, we still keep in touch. We still talk about like you know how things are, and you know, always always useful to get insights uh, and and you know trends. So yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's sort it's sort of like uh, the school always measures how many classes we teach per semester, but the real thing is is a lot of my job is just talking to people. <laughs> Yeah. So, Mike, I um, I know about the USC games, and we have something called the Demo Day, right? Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about it. What is the Demo Day like? Um, how is it that? What do students do um, during that time? And uh, and how does it play a role in in um, hiring? Well, in uh, spring 2019, we decided to change our branding and name our uh, pro our joint program between Cinema, the, the USC Games program. And we had our first live uh, USC Games Expo in uh, May of 2019. We had 1,200 attendees, which is about three times larger than what we used to have before then. And we thought it was absolutely wonderful, spectacular. We had lots of people sit there and play our student games. And uh, this May, we uh, were under COVID lockdown. And we did it fully online, and we had 82,000 people watch. We went from being something you had to drive to to something that you could watch from anywhere. And it was like a television show. And it was, it turned out to be fantastic. And honestly, if we get back to being able to do things in person again, we really do need to do the streaming thing simultaneously because the audience is much larger. So is, are these uh, the games? Um, and who is the audience? Well, the, you know, the people who come to the USC Games Expo are people who want to hire students, uh, people who want to look for new intellectual property, games they could potentially license, technology they could potentially license, um, people who are doing startups who want to, you know, I'll have people call up and say, I, I've got, you know, $10 million to do a startup, I need to hire like five engineers, who should I pick? And and I know it's very hard for me to answer that question because I usually don't know the state of who has a job and who does not. And I, I tell them we have this mailing list that you should post on and you will get an interesting response. And yeah. 
even the smallest of companies will get five to 10 responses from people who need a job. So the, X, the, the USA Games Expo, the demo day is super important for our students. We need to do it at the end of every semester. I believe we're we'll probably doing it at the end of December, probably again online, but it, it's, it's of great value. Plus it's also where our alumni come back to the school. Our alumni come back to the school and they see what the people who are still in school are building and they go, well, you know what? When I need an engineer or I need a gameplay designer, I'm gonna grab these guys because they're from USC. So there is yeah. this big capability of USC people who are working in the industry to pull our alumni, our students who are graduating into jobs. Candice, did you have something to add to this? Um, I would just say it, the game development program area is so unique because you have a steward like Mike who has his own connections and his own network and so those individuals are coming to events in may and december and we also had you know 162 companies hiring game students go to the engineering career center they're also working with the school of cinema they're also working centrally with the university career center i would say of all of our engineering programs the web of networks for students in the game development program is wide and it's interesting because you'll you'll meet with different universities and there might be that one human or that one office the beauty of the program at USC is there are multiple teams there to help you. And the fact that you have your, your the faculty lead um, also hosting events, that's huge. For me, I just want, I love to see all of the USC students have so many connection points. And the fact that a game development student could have a flagship event for their program almost every other month to meet and network and showcase what they're working on, that's fantastic. And it's something that um, I'm clearly biased, but I see that at USC. I don't see that at a lot of institutions. And, and part of it is because the program itself has a lot of passion behind that, has its own network, in addition to the resources that the university has to offer in terms of a career center. Um, the fact that there is an expo in May and December, that's huge. That, that's all just added value to students who are in this program. So um, all of these are just part of this big web that is unique for our game development students. Plus, the other thing is, is LinkedIn. So all of my past students are connected to me on LinkedIn. All of the hiring people in the game industry and computing industries and all of the chief technology and chief creative officers are connected to me on LinkedIn. So I have like 7,500 links. And so often the student will say, I, I want to go to this new stu this studio. Do you know anybody there? And what happens is as people change jobs, they update their LinkedIn and I go, yeah, I know this guy here. He's a graduate of our program. We can send your resume to him and see if he can help you uh, circulate it. Yeah, I know. I, I'm uh, pretty sure that many of our alums are in uh, hiring uh, positions now, right? And, oh, and sometimes an alum won't even reach out to anyone. I mean, they usually reach out to someone. But the beauty of something like LinkedIn is if you work for an organization, you have the power to search for someone with a game development degree from USC and never talk to an office. That's a whole other connection point. So there's so many ways that students are going to be able to find these opportunities, which um, is, is fantastic. Yeah, so um, I know, uh, Mike, maybe you'll have to leave uh, fairly soon. Uh, you have a class coming up. Yes. Um, but uh, if, um, before you go, I just wanted you to give some advice uh, for someone who thinks that they're interested in this area, but don't quite know how to go about developing the tools and what they need to do to do well in this area, not just um, getting into the program, but also in, in a career in this entire area. Well, you know, if you, you know, come to this program, if you want to build a software game in Teams, and you think that's fun, and what you should think about is, is, is you have to truly love games. So one of the things that I notice is the students that I have, they, they play games like bad. You know, he played with his high school kid, his high school friends. He played probably with his middle school friends as well. And uh, for him to go into a games program wasn't on his mind. But when he got in, it's like, oh, I should have been doing this all along. And, and, and let's just say the program is fun. So most of the classes in the games program are build a project over the course of a semester in a team. There's no midterm, there's no final. The final is the demo of your game and the turning in of your trailer and your building of your team's website. And that, that makes people work harder. 
And we show them the trailers of the work from the prior semester and they go, oh, I've got to reach that. I will do better than that. So every time we do our USC Games Expo, people come up to me and say, God, the games are so much better than last year. Well, they've been telling me that for 16 years. I, yeah. All of the trailers for our games from 2005 to the present are on my website. And so you can yeah. see where we started and see where we are now. And we build very cool things and all of our students should be proud. And I'm always excited. The USC Games Expo is kind of like Christmas twice a year for me, which is I get to see what my students uh, deliver and give me as presents. And it's just, it's a great joy. And yeah. One of the complaints I get from the CS department is, "Why well, you gave a lot of A's in this class. Yeah, because the students worked hard and did fantastic. And yeah. it, other I'm sure everybody is very motivated. I'm sure they end up uh, really, really working hard for that A though. They're yeah. motivated yeah. because they know if they do a great job and show it at the Games Expo, that they're gonna get a job. And so it's, it's like their future. So they work hard at it. Yeah. And so it's, it makes it so people say, do you have to, you know, talk, give your students a schedule? I said, well, we talk to every single student every single week to find out the progress of their team. I'm yeah. not sure there are many other classes in engineering that do that, but I do that. The whole game yeah. structure does that. And so you get a lot of, a lot of advice, a lot of good handholding and, and uh, help towards doing great stuff. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Beth? What kind of advice would you give someone who is trying to get into this area? I mean, uh, just learn and implement whatever you can on your on your end for sure. Uh, you know, taking take a game scores, um, you know, from USC. Um, at the same time, uh, we like again for me, like uh, I used to tell students uh, who have been advising for almost like fourteen years now. Uh, I've been telling students that. There is always one game scores which will get you the job in the industry. Uh, you just don't know which one it is because sometimes <laughs> it's it's mobile games for people. Sometimes, like for me, it was advanced games. Uh, so there's always one course that there is that one turning point course in your in your education which will actually get you the job. Uh, but then on the other hand, again, demo day has just grown uh, so much. In fact, like we like. I'm one of those people who are like super vocal about like how, what what things are there. In fact, like even when I have my interviews for for people uh, uh, interning uh, in my studios, I actually uh, talk to Mike. I tell him like, you know what? Like these are the this is what happens in this school. This is what hap Like the, this is the kind of knowledge which you know someone in in this school has, and you know kind of help. Uh, nurture and evolve the students. In fact, I've been uh, I've come to a couple of midterm projects too, just to see how the games are are developing. In fact, I even through those uh, midterm projects, I actually ended ended up mentoring a couple of students too, uh, who I even now keep in touch with. And you know, Demo Day in general has a pers like for me has a personal uh, attachment to it because my uh, actual job offer with Activision back in 2007. Uh, came yeah. on demo day uh, because I had my interview scheduled the day before demo day and the interview just went on and on the entire day. Uh, in fact, I remember the, the time where I finished my interview, took the bus back to USC and ran to the lab to see what the state of my project is because that was the thing which I had to deliver the next day and I was the lead for the for the project. And then the next morning, my project was the first thing which we showed in the demo day showcase. And at that point of time, I think demo day had like probably uh, 50 people overflowing a small RTH th three to one uh, room. Yes. And and then uh, af my interview, uh, because one of the VPs of Activision was not pre was out of office that previous day, he actually came for demo day. My interview continued after my showcase. Uh, that day, and then after that interview was the day was the time where they gave me the offer. So you know, demo day 2007 was something in history for me, and and you know, and and that's what it's been. Like even even today, like when we like when people go to demo day, they talk about what their views and insights and kind of appreciate the kind of ideas which people bring in. But beyond that, I think even even if they don't uh, give a spot on the spot offer, many people give uh, opportunities to you know get called for interviews, which itself is a big thing. Uh, but 
even beyond that, people actually um, give a lot of feedback and that feedback is super valuable because that helps them. It doesn't matter which company or whether they start their own company, it actually gives them enough feedback to kind of take and move on and become a better game developer. So um, in that aspect, like the program has evolved and it also has dealt with like cutting edge, you know, right from game engine development to like console game development to a lot of different things. So uh, yeah. it's really, yeah. really good. But yeah, continue learning because learning is the only thing which can lead you to that point. So how do students get internships in this industry? Well, I, I think a lot of it was uh, through our connections. You know, so, so a, a lot of what I tell students to do is to, most of these companies now have online processes for application. So I tell our students, you know, please apply online. And then if, if you apply, say at Activision, then send me a note that you have applied at Activision for a particular job. And then I will write to the person I know who's over there at that part of Activision and say, talk to this person because this person is great. Okay. And I think 99% yeah. of the time Activision will interview that person. Uh, yeah. But that's true for a lot of companies. I just use Activision because uh, I think at one point uh, they were hiring all of our superstars. <laughs> and I, I think we got to like, was it half the engineers were from, Act, uh, from USC? So you can't make Call of Duty without USC alums at this point. Okay. We, have, we have at least 15 of those at the moment. Yes. In Activision? Yeah. In, in, the, in the Call of Duty franchise, uh, spread across different studios. Yes. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, Candice, um, maybe you can tell us more about how a student can find internships. Yes, so um, a number of the students find internships at, of course, ne through networking, and you're hearing working with their program, but there are a lot of services and events that we also host within the School <coughs> of Engineering's Career Center. And so students actually report back to us and let us know, this is how I'm getting connected. Um, and so a number of those connections happen at Trojan Talks. These are information, information sessions where a number of companies like Activision will work with our office and come and just speak for 45 minutes in an evening about opportunities. Um, but you'll also have, you know, in companies seeking game development, um, students that you just might not know they're interested in that. So it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go to this session hosted by Cisco. Interesting, they're doing a lot of hiring and game development, why? And so that's something that they would share in their Trojan talk. Um, so these intimate yeah. settings where you actually get to connect with the organization, have conversations, um, any of the unique events that we host for companies. So um, we also have you know game development forums and events as well, where a company will call and say, hey, um, can we partner with you on this? And we're like, we'll just reach out to the students. I mean, that that's that, that's what we do. We make that connection. So um, those activities um, lend to internships, sometimes longer opportunities like co-ops. So students that are in game development who might be interested in maybe doing work with the U.S. military or something, you know, an entity like that, they might do a co-op, which means they're working during the academic semester. But of course, uh, full-time opportunities as well. Yeah. Now I know um, you do an amazing amount of work with uh, uh, students. So maybe you can uh, just tell us a little bit about the kinds of things that you do um, uh, before we go on to talk about the companies that hire students from uh, game development area. Absolutely. So this is a snapshot for last year. So this is just last last year, 2019 to 20. 20 with the Viterbi Career Center. Now, mind you, there is a general USC Career Center that all students can, can access. So that's always at your fingertips. Um, but this is specific to our engineering students. So this past year, we had around 4,500 job postings in something that we call Viterbi Gateway. Um, students are able to access that. They have their own profile like LinkedIn. And so by going on there, you can see what your match is based on the positions that our employers have posted. We also have an expo. It's our uh, career and internship expo. We offer that twice a year. Um, it's usually September, October for the fall and in the springtime around February. And um, we are fully virtual with those expos this year. And we have around 200 unique companies that attend the expos. Um, Trojan Talks, like I mentioned, are information sessions. And we also have a number of signature and events and workshops. So workshops on understanding curricular practical training, or if you're coming from outside of the US, how are you able to intern with EA? What does that look like? How can we support you there? I'm recruiting in a virtual environment. This is a whole new session. 
because you're not meeting face to face with people anymore. You're now con connecting, you know, with the Brady Bunch look and feel. And how do you make that connection? How do you get your portfolio across? So all of that is part of that workshop. And you can see there are many um, workshops that the team hosts. Um, some of these events are also hosted by our employers. Um, special events like uh, the Career and Internship Boot Camp. So if you had two days to learn how to even get started in this process, there's a boot camp for that. How to get hired series. Um, and then there are forums and events again that we work with companies on. Um, and for this area, we have coding challenges, um, the game development forum. So again, these are just additional events that you can attend. And sometimes they're learning events. So how do you learn to network um, and connect in this area? And then that could turn into a conversation about a job opportunity because you have these panelists from companies there. And then you start having conversations about other things. And then you could leave an event like a forum or a panel with an internship opportunity because it's all part of that networking experience. Now that's um, the kind of opportunities that you guys bring to our students is pretty amazing. So I'm going to scroll, okay? You want yeah. to scroll, okay? So this is a highlight of, um, and, and so Suda had asked, you had asked about what companies are hiring our F1 students um, in game development. So this, this was just last year alone, we had 162 organizations check and let us know we want game development students um, and they can be f1 meaning um we're, we're open to hosting students um, if they're on internship for cpt or maybe hiring them for an h1b when they graduate so there are 97 unique job postings for our f1 students in game development um, but 63 of those companies attended our career and internship expo so that's hosted by the vitrupri uh, career center and then 29 of those companies hosted information sessions. So those are those evenings where you just have those intimate discussions about that organization and the opportunities that they have available. Okay, so I'm going to kind of scroll through the next yeah. few slides a little slowly and maybe I'll go back as well. Yes. Um, so you can tell us a little bit more. Okay. So, so it really is just a, a long list of companies this past year. Um, but I, I think one thing you should notice is there are companies and you can keep scrolling that you might not connect with hiring game development students. And so this is why these information sessions are important because we we say um, the big names all the time. We'll always say Activision, we'll mention Electronic Arts, but then we have to remember Facebook did a lot of game development hiring. Ha ha, why? So you just, not why, we know why, but you might not realize Mozilla is doing hiring in this space. Mathwork <laughs> is doing Sachs. hiring. So Goldman Sachs. And so sometimes, so this is where the conversation is important because the companies will let you know um, they might actually have a unique project where you're going to develop a game or sometimes they're just looking for a human who has that game development mindset they're looking for that creative engineer to come in and do something else for the organization so that's why the conversation is important to make sure that you are a fit for them and they are a fit for you because what goldman sachs might want you to do might not be what your vision is as a game development student or a game development professional but it's important to just have that conversation because they want you and just at that point, you want to figure out why do they want me? And it could be because of the way you think and the logic that you could apply for the organization or the way that your creative engineering mind works, or they might actually be having you work on a game development project within their organization. You don't know what their goal is until you have those conversations with them. Okay. So, um, Pat, what are the major companies in, uh, in game development nowadays? I mean, uh... Generally, you can you can look at the typical like game publishers like Activision Blizzard, EA, Rockstar, Rocksteady, mm -hmm. uh, Ubisoft, uh, you know, Take Two. Uh, some of those uh, companies are the big like gaming focused ones. But at the same time, like as uh, Candace Candace mentioned, uh, is like uh, there is Apple, there is Microsoft, there is Google. Uh, you know, uh, Sony. Uh, so there is just like a, a lot, like even Amazon, for example, has entered into the gaming industry. So there is just like uh, some of these big companies, which are typically not the the you won't think of them as the game publishers or the game right. developer companies, but there is a lot of them, and there's a yeah. lot of research yeah. happening. And and as yeah. I mentioned before, like Tesla or or SpaceX, you know, stuff which you would not even con like consider even remotely close it's, to the game industry true. is yeah. is now hiring. So that's right. So and I think that uh, highlights the reason why students need to visit the career center and connect with the advisors over there, um, so that 
they can find out all the companies that will hire into a particular yeah. position. And this goes not just for game development, but pretty much any other area as well. Right. So what is this uh, particular slide, um, uh, Candice? This is just a highlight of um, at the end of each year, we have something called the first destination survey. It's actually a national survey um, that uh, universities complete and students. It's optional, but they, they share with us where they're going, um, what some of their job titles are, salary information. And so this is just a highlight this past May, what students shared who were finishing with game development degrees. And um, you can see it's just, you know, a highlight of titles. Some have the title of game developer or development engineer, graphics programmer, gameplay engineer, game programmer. Um, and so this, this is optional. Um, this is definitely not the entire list of the titles of students, but it's just a, a, a small list of what some of the students had shared. It's the most common one too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Bat, what are the types of salaries that starting um, game developers can hope to get? Uh, I mean, I, I would say it, it should be around, like, uh, for at least programmers, uh, it should be around the 70, 70 to 80K mark in a typical game development uh, f forum. And, you know, again, like, depending on, on which companies you work in, if you're working on the, some of the bigger companies, you might probably hit the six-figure six mark uh, as starting. But again, like, it's, it's highly, like, uh, highly likely that it's going to be around, like, the 65 to 70 mark. Okay. Oh, Candace, what is this? Um, what are these? Uh, who are all these beautiful ladies? Is Candace here? Okay. So um, uh, these are uh, our career um, services staff members. So just mm -hmm. faces. Okay. Are you so there, the Candace? Yes, okay. I'm here. I'm here. They're, they're okay. the faces that you will. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, those I are can. those are just the faces you'll connect with uh, virtually if it's this semester or you know in the near future. Um, but they're the beginning of um, just trying to have that network. So you'll you have you know Mike Zaida who is an amazing contact for you. You can hear that students are constantly calling him for advice. Um, but when you're just trying to figure out how to negotiate. Um, how to update your CV, what just what is this whole recruitment culture? This team is here to help you with all of the, the parts of the process. Wow. And uh, one thing I'd like to say is not so common for a university to have a career center just for the School of Engineering. We're one of the very few universities, uh, or are we the only university, Candice? We, to my knowledge, we are still the only university. Yeah. So, with a career center dedicated to the School of Engineering. Okay, so um, this particular slide is about a master's in computer science in game development. This is the program that Mike Zyder, um started. Um, unfortunately, that he had to leave, but uh, I think Bat took this program as well. Um, you want to say a few words about the program, uh, Bat? Yeah, in, in general, like uh, the game development uh, masters uh, in computer science specializing in game development kind of covers uh, a holistic foundation of the different area, key areas of the game industry in general. Uh, you know, they again, like there is a game engines class, there's a mobile games class, there's, you know, AI, like network AI class, uh, and there is now like, you know, other classes which are focused even on like VR and AR development. And sometimes there are also like classes which uh, our, our teams which are formed in these classes where it has the mix of uh, people in other fields too. Uh, and this was, you know, a trend right from the days when I was studying at USC, uh, where we actually had people in electrical engineering, you know, uh, taking a game development class and they eventually actually even made a haptic feedback uh, glove, which they used and kind of interfaced it with the game. And these days it's been focused more towards like these, uh, you know, like Oculus or HTC Vive and other like uh, VR uh, headsets and stuff, which you can actually use and make games for. Um, and I've I've seen again like the constant development of you know these cu cutting edge tech because companies are also interested in getting uh, students to be involved in in development of those uh, pro uh, games for those products. But at the same time, it actually gives kind of like a, a an overall umbrella of different key areas of game development. Okay, thank you so much. So before we go to the chat section and to look for additional questions, um, just wanted to give you my email address. And if you have any questions, please feel free to 
write to me. Um, you can take a, a picture of this uh, screen, uh, do a screenshot. And um, I mentioned uh, earlier that this was the sixth in a series of uh, um, panel discussions that we've had. Um, so uh, all the others uh, are now done, but we do have the recordings available and the recordings will be available at that website below. Um, so if you have friends who are interested in these um, areas, uh, please feel free to tell them about it. And uh, if you're interested in this game development, um, uh, the recording, um, you can get it at the same site, but it might take a few days before we uh, put it back. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to take a look at um, the questions that have come up on the chat site. Um, so Bat and Candice, you will be answering um, some of these questions. So the first question is, um, okay, you want to get that Bat? It's from Nitya Chandramali. Oh, you may you may not have it. Okay, is um, eighty six the future of architecture, or is it a power PC, or is it proprietary? I think this question came up when Mike was talking about architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you may not be able to. Yeah, I'm I'm not really sure about it. Uh, but but power PC was was a a thing before in the early days, but these days power PC is dead, in some ways. Okay. All right, the next question is, could microchips like cell processor be used for computing in the future? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm interested in games and want to know the possible positions as an engineering in game industry. So I guess he would like to know um, what are the uh, kind of possible positions um, uh, that they can hope to get in the game industry. It's kind of covered by a work like Candice. Candice showed already, uh, but maybe you can mention a few titles uh, back. Yeah, generally uh, for, for freshers, you will join the company as either an, like generally in the associate level. So you'll be like, your title can vary from being like associate game developer to associate engineer to, you know, um, yeah. But generally it's in the associate level that's that's how we hire uh, interns who convert into full time or people who are just directly entering a company uh, full time uh, early positions as associate and then you you eventually the climbing up the ladder would be associate to senior associate if possible and then other than that it will be like engineer and then it'll be senior engineer and then specialist and principal and so on very good um, Candice, do you have any last, last words of advice to our audience? My, my main words of advice is uh, as soon as you get started in a program, start having the conversations with the faculty members um, and the organizations and connecting with career centers. Um, sometimes students wait because they'll hear, oh, I should have a portfolio or I should have my website done. And, you know, you take copious notes at, at panels like this and you think you have to be this perfect package before you start to have these conversations and you don't need to be. Part of the networking and part of the process is learning what you should be thinking about when you start your program. So even when you don't have that portfolio, even when you don't have that information available and you're very early in your program, still go to the events, ask questions, take notes, see what people maybe in their senior or final year are doing and know that that's something that you should strive for, um, but engage early on. Ask the questions that's going to help you get ready for when it's time for an internship or a full-time position. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Bat? Candice okay. had great advice and um, and uh, pretty much closing comments from your end as well. Yeah, I mean, just uh, just like Candice mentioned, like you know, get started early. Uh, again, if you are looking at a specific job or a type of role, look for it. Generally, it's going to be almost the same thing across different websites, especially for newer positions. Uh, make sure you learn uh, Unreal and Unity, uh, or, or either or, or both, uh, if possible. Uh, if you want to learn the foundations of, of game, game development, uh, try to make your own engine. Uh, there are also tutorials online on how to make your own engine, and that will give you some hands-on uh, work on how you, you make a, an engine and 
what are the different components and stuff. But beyond that, again, like if be passionate and good luck. Wonderful advice. I think this has been a really um, interesting panel. Uh, personally, I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did as well. Uh, thank you so much, Bat. Uh, thanks to Mike and thank you, Candice. And uh, wherever you are, have a wonderful day and stay safe. Good night from India. This routine was actually choreographed by me, Bailey Sock. Okay, that took my class. I did. My first time ever taking your class. I'm honored. I can't, I honestly can't believe it. I'm so crazy. That's so crazy. So we can all learn.